You're listening to Changing Reality. Changing Reality, where we bend reality all across the world. Only on WQHS Radio. So hi everyone and welcome one, welcome all to Changing Reality. We are so excited to have you as always. And for all of you who are new to the show, Changing Reality is essentially a show that features phenomenal people from all walks of life who are in essence changing their own reality. And through this show, we have the opportunity to speak to, interview and hang out with amazing individuals from social change makers, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, industry experts, to even artists, musicians, and inspiring individuals from all across the world. Many who have spent some time around the Penn campus and many others who have gone out there and changed the world around them. And by hearing these inspiring stories on how they have managed to do so, hopefully we'll be able to pick up a little bit of nuggets of wisdom that we can use in our own lives and to shorten our own learning curve as we try to work towards our goals as well. And this is a show that's something so meaningful to me and many others on campus just because we wanted to do a show that was a kind of like a front row seat to the experiences the, the formative, uh, I would say, journeys that many successful people have. And I wanted to do this show simply because I felt like there are a lot of people out there who do absolutely brilliant, phenomenal things and make waves in the lives of those around them. And I'm very passionate about learning how they became who they are today and how their reality first had to change to make them the people who are able to impact others. And all of this, I think, boils down to how powerful stories really are it's something that I've always believed. And personally, to show you how much I've, I've seen the power of stories shape my own life and how I've seen it shape the life of others. I actually founded and run a youth movement called Ascendance back at home in Malaysia, which is where I'm from, that collaborates with not just our Malaysian Ministry of Education, but global education partners all around the world in 28 different countries to provide an alternative education platform for any student who wants to change their reality. So we work with students from elementary all the way up to college through various sessions, programs, experiential learning activities, and projects that help them discover their passion, learn about themselves and the world around them, and start their own careers even while they're still in school. And we've been fortunate to date to work with only, uh, with I think, over 35,000 students, 970 communities, and have helped incubate a countless number of student-run projects and even social enterprises that are run by students aged 8 to 20 years old. And the essence behind all of this, the reason we've been able to build this, has been stories. It's been kind individuals who have taken their time out of their busy schedules to come and share what changed in their lives, what were the things that they'd learned along the way. And by sharing these experiences, imparting that knowledge, to us, the next generation, in a sense, and enabling us to, in a way, have the additional experiences that we need to create our own reality. So I hope that this show is that same platform for all of you, that through this show, you're able to get the experiences that not only resonate with you, but help you build the future that you want. And if there's any specific themes, topics, uh, areas of interest that you want to learn more about, please do let us know as well. And we'll do our best to make sure that we can bring it into the show and share more about what you want to learn with you as well. And with that, I think we're going to be moving into our segment for today. We have someone who's absolutely amazing and a, a, a brilliant trainer, speaker. And we have with us Tarun Jane, who is a talent strategist with a keen interest in building, engaging, inclusive, consistent learner experiences. He is a coach and facilitator at heart and previously played numerous large roles in organizations in the learning and organizational development space. He was formerly the head of learning and global talent lead at Deloitte India, where today he serves as their talent lead as well. Our speaker leverages on modern day tech solutions to scale and solve for organization wide talent challenges, whether that's recruitment, onboarding, learning, adoption and retention, performance management, and many others. And he has been someone in a personal capacity who has inspired many others, who has brought out the best in people as well, and has a brilliant story of his experiences of how he got to where he is today. So without further ado, let's welcome our amazing guest speaker onto our virtual stage to help answer some questions and share with us his thoughts as well. Hello, hi Tarun, how are you today? Very well, Harsha. I'm well. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. 
and thank you so much for joining us on the show as i was saying i've always been in uh, like like i think in our previous chat i mentioned i actually reached out to you because i saw that you actually studied positive psychology at penn and that is something that i am very passionate about and as i was learning more about the work that you were doing i think through our conversation the last time i was very blown away by the impact that you have had in people's life in your professional role uh, as well as in your personal capacity to help others in need. So something that I'm so excited to talk about here today. But before we jump right in to your story and all of that, I was just very curious. When you were growing up, did you know that you would one day go and have a career that would impact so many people's life? Or was this something that came naturally later in life? Or were you at, at age 11 already thinking, I'm going to change the world, I'm going to make everyone's life better? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, had you asked me in my childhood, I, I would tell you I want to be a captain and sail. So I used to be in Merchant Navy. That's how I really started, Harsha. And uh, but yeah, I no, I the answer is no. I don't think I would have sort of said I want to impact. But what I could have told you is that my friends sort of reach out to me for any issue challenge that they have, even in childhood, you know, in school days, you know, they would reach out to me for advice. So you were the, 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 the friend who always knew, okay, had some emotional intelligence in the group. Very interesting in a sense. Where do you think your, your, your love for, like, um, in a way, I wouldn't say necessarily training, but your love for being able to bring out thoughts and, and, and help people have a different perspective. You mentioned that your friends would come to your advice. Do you think it was something that came innately to you even as a kid? Or was it something that, you know, people develop? Like, is it a skill that is learned or is it a skill that you feel is you're born with in a sense? Yeah. You know, when I got married, it's interesting that my wife actually came up to me and really pinpointed that for me. She said, you're a great listener. And I'm like, aha, no wonder I have people walk up to me since childhood. So I wasn't really doing anything exceptional, Harsha. All I was doing was just curiously listening. You know, so a part of it is inherent, perhaps. And then, of course, it's also developed because in professional world, uh, you know, it comes in very, very handy because with that, what comes is that you actually ask them questions because you really want to know what they might be going through, what they might be feeling. So I think that in sense then directly led me towards, you know, pursuing coaching as a career as well, because those are some of the critical skills as a as a coach. Amazing, amazing. And do you, do you think this is something that your family and all noticed in you as a kid or, or something that, you know, was a defining feature of who you are? I think we actually have a little photo from your childhood as well that I thought was cute that we could kind of pull, put up for the audience to have some perspective. But yeah, so this is you, I think, with your family. Tell us about this picture. Oh, yes. Oh, man. This brings back such um wonderful memories one because that point in time three of us were together this is me with my two elder sisters and um you know at, at a very young age i sort of lost one of my parents and that actually got the four of us my dad and the two sisters and me uh, sort of much more together and we had this bond and you know i'm, I'm fortunate to to have a single parent who sort of really did so much for us and um, perhaps inculcated these values in me that uh, as in hindsight or as you sort of picked up um, have impacted people um, you know in some way or the other amazing amazing but as you said it wasn't something that you you know got into straight away as a career i think you mentioned earlier as a, as a bit of a spoiler that you actually were, became a sailor to start off in a sense you were in the navy how on earth do you actually start a career and this is something that we normally watch in tv right but how did you number one get inspired to go into this career and what was the process and, and the experience of actually joining uh, the navy being in the life of a sailor is it very much like top gun or, or have we got it a bit wrong <laughs> so yes, so Merchant Navy is slightly different. It's more commercial than uh, the defense services. And, you know, I was in an oil tanker, so I, I joined them as a deck cadet. And back in the day, this is early 2000, uh, you know, this was really an upcoming field where a lot of organizations were looking for sailors. And, uh, you know, I've always loved uh, to travel. And when I actually joined uh, this crew, it was all multicultural. 
So, Arsha, that's where I actually started engaging. I was all of, you know, ending about my teens and here I am, you know, in a foreign country and sailing with foreign nationalities. Uh, I come from a small town, so my exposure to these cultures weren't, weren't as much. And then how did, you know, how did I adapt to them? What sort of was okay for their culture, not okay for a conservative culture out of India? Things like that, you know, so it really broadened my worldview, if you will, at that uh, young age. And, you know, till today, it served me well because I'm able to engage with different cultures by being, you know, so much open and uh, careful about what might work and what might not in, in some of these cultures. And I think the career itself is a very disciplined career, right? So you 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 literally keep a ship running that's part of the job in a sense so how did like what was the most surprising thing about that whole aspect of your career that you that caught you off guard when you first joined in a sense yes absolutely i'll i'll share an example with you harsha you know i've always been very close to my family as i said and positive psychology you know perma model uh, Dr. Seligman talks about those positive relationships, you know, um, so strongly. And uh, when I joined the ship, I was a new chap, right? And then uh, we had duties. I would finish my duty quickly in the morning to get back to the mess so I could have breakfast with everyone together. And, you know, I finished up my work, excited. I'm going to meet the crew, sit with them, have breakfast. And one of the seniors looks at me and says, hey, you're here. Can you go to the deck? release the person who's actually on the watch because he's a friend of mine so we could have breakfast together and you know of course i was a new guy on the ship i said sure sir and i went out and i relieved the other person so they could have breakfast together by the time i got back harsha everyone had left the mess and i was the only one having breakfast oh. and and i'm kidding you not i had tears down saying, you know, I've never had a meal by myself. And as you know, there are angels all around, the chef looked at me, he came and he gave me company. You know, he said, uh, I see some things, uh, you know, changed in you. And he said, let me give you company. So yeah, that's, that's something that, uh, you know, stayed with me. That is amazing in a sense. And, and I think very reflective of being a new person in a new space and as you said not having that experience before very interesting the, what were you what was the your favorite part in a sense or, or the thing that taught you the most throughout your career as a sailor as you said you were going to different countries you're mixing people from different parts of the world well, did you have any culture shock moments or anything that particularly was formative to the way that you looked at the world or your outlook on the wider community from that experience? Yeah, I think I think this cultural uh, sensitivity is something that I did learn because there were certain things that you could have shared with certain cultures and, you know, that was OK. But with some other culture, it, it wasn't OK. And then how do you really build relationship with people who come from very different backgrounds and might not have things uh, common with you, right? There were, there were festivals that give you, um, you know, the picture that you showed my childhood is a festival of color. We call it Holi in India and we play with colors. And it was, it was particularly this festival when we were on the deck and I actually shared with my fellow colleagues from different countries that in our country today, everyone is celebrating this. We did not have colors, of course, Harsha, on board. But what we did have were hoses. And we were on the deck. They said, OK, why don't we clean the deck today? We put a hose in place. We had that water on board. And then we actually played with that hose, you know, sort of as if we were having a water party at a water park. You know, so so that that's something that I love that those guys embraced one of our uh, holidays or our you know uh, sort of festivals, and we had a lot of fun. We didn't have cameras those days, Harsh. I wish I had some pictures, you know, that that we could use. But yeah, in hindsight, uh, yeah, that was really really fun, embracing, you know, a festival of a country together with different cultures. Oh, it's very interesting and the way that you use whatever was there you know you're on a ship you you can't get anything just 
by walking to a store or anything you literally fall in the ocean so so that's absolutely. Very, absolutely absolutely and you know and and i would and i would link this to what you were asking harsha it it really i have somehow what's in your control and focusing on that has played such a big role in my life harsha and you know you're talking about changing realities so i want to talk about that uh, when i look back i can quote instances and i don't know if it's the value system that i was grown up with you know being being in the uh jain traditional family jainism is you know similar to buddhism not so similar uh but just you know focusing on what is it that you can do and focus and not really fretting about things that are out of your control i think that has served me really well over these years and any workshop that i have done you know there is always a reference of that there is modern management books that's talking about it there is old sufi um saints or folklore from where i come that talks about it that you know you could keep talking about whatever but if you can't really look inwards and see what's in your control you know um yeah uh, there is there is just so much more power that you feel when your lens towards looking at things is hey what's in my control and what can i do versus fretting over things that are out of my control and happening to me no that's a very very good outlook on life one thing that i always struggle with is reminding myself of that because you you like when 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 i'm okay i understand okay you know what i like i can manage this i can manage this i can manage that but sometimes it's like when when i am emotionally affected by something or i think when most people are we tend to blame external factors we tend to say oh this thing went wrong that thing went wrong and all of that that to remember that we have the control is a little bit tough how do you in, when times are of stressful when 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 there's pressure and all of that remind yourself of that and be able to apply that i mean again you you had you lost a parent at a young age you were on a ship where you know i'm sure it's a very high stress work environment at times as well so how do you in each of these situations make sure that you, that is always at the forefront of your mind yeah you know um while while losing that parent at an early age harsha i realized that there are so many things that are not in our control you know and if that can happen to me anything can happen at any point in time the funny part is harsha that life goes on you know i still woke up the next day i was still hungry you know i would be crying i would be moaning over but you know life goes on and and at the young age when i realized that that you know you don't control that but bon jovi's song you know keep the faith i think just that trust and that faith that there is you know this too shall pass and the best is yet to come you know so i think just the trust and faith in that it's not why me it's perhaps why not me you know <laughs> just that uh, thing that that keeps me going all the time okay very very well said and as a bon jovi fan myself appreciate the the drop in the, of the song suggestion there moving into the next phase into what you did when you came back from from the, your career you know merchant navy and all of that you pivoted into something completely different which is in a way the corporate world how first of all tell us a little bit about the circumstances of you returning home and deciding okay i've had this amazing experience how do, now i'm going to do something completely different how did you make those kind of career decisions yeah call call me a fatalist one of my bosses used to call me a benign fatalist so you know i I've, i've always believed what what comes your way is meant to come your way and you know again this is part of that trust that you know it's it's come for a reason and all the right reasons uh, so when i came back the reason i came back importantly harsha is my sister was getting married that was my first one of the elder sister getting married and i couldn't miss it for the world you know and signing off the ship meant breaking my contract and then going back became even harder and i said okay it's god's way of perhaps saying you know that that's what that was it so i i gave importance to the relation that i had with my sister and that event over my career at that point in time could be silly could be stupid but well all for the right reasons here i am you know after 18 years of of that happening this was back in early 2000 so when i came back i had not completed my graduation and i was already financially independent 
And I wanted to continue that. I wanted to continue to be financially independent because I had some support that I had to give to my family financially. And I said, okay, so what can I do? And I started work with uh, GE, Capital International Services. It was called Jekis. The organization is now GenPAC. They took undergrads at that point in time. And I continued my studies, um, you know, through School of Open Learning. So I actually did part-time study and continued my work. Uh, you know, did I know I'm going to get into learning? I didn't even know something like that existed. You know, I, I played, you know, just one day at a time. I joined that. It was a good organization. It kept my financial um, liabilities at bay. And, uh, you know, I started with that. But when I did get into my training, I looked at the trainer and I said, hey, I want to get there. And then I got to know of a phrase, gift of the gab. They said, you have it. I said, wonderful if I have it. I remember I, I think it was about six rounds of interviews to become a trainer with GE. And, uh, you know, they invested a lot in us. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks to them, I got into training and the rest is history. You know, um, soft skills to behavioral skills, to coaching, to manager, to manager of managers, to then strategy and, uh, you know, talent and learning has, has been, you know, what I've been engaged with mostly for the last uh, 18 years or so now. No, no, that's just amazing. And I think we can definitely tell from your story, from your outlook in life, that it is a job that is apt for you, something that you that, that would probably, as you said, come naturally and be enhanced by all of the learning that you were doing. So how was it like for you as an individual at that point of time, relatively young as well, stepping into a training room as the facilitator? Did it go as, like, did you have your movie magic moment? Because from my experiences, training seldom go right in the back end as we see in the front end. So what was your first experience in the training room as the facilitator yourself? Oh my, um, you bring back some more memories, Harsha. Now, you know, I remember I had to keep a stubble. Um, that point in time, it wasn't as much uh, salt and pepper. It was much more uh, pepper than salt. And But I kept it because there were people who were elder than me, you know, that, that were part of my training. Now, the childhood picture that you uh, presented, Harsha, and you know, that just tells that I was fortunate to have a good childhood in spite of everything that we went through. You know, so my, and I've always been into meditation. Um, so, you know, I remember, okay, this is my first group workshop. What do I do? So I said, okay, let me do some breathing exercises. Cause you know, uh, if your breathing is fine, you're able to communicate much better and also in touch with yourself, right? You're much more present and mindful. So I said, let me start this breathing exercise before we get into the workshop. And I remember, uh, I, I did a guided sort of breathing exercise for about three, three minutes or so with the group. And I said, how can I make them go back, relive a happy moment? So I said, go back to your childhood. Uh, and this was me at a young age thinking my childhood was happy. So everyone's childhood was happy. And then, you know, after the point in time when I said, okay, now open your eyes. And I thought everyone would be smiling, thinking of a pleasant childhood memory and we could get right into training. And that wasn't the... That wasn't what's supposed to happen. What happened is some of the guys opened their eyes and they had tears in their eyes because they had a childhood memory that wasn't as pleasant. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do? What did I start? <laughs> so I, you know, right there in that, you know, you have a plan, but it never goes by plan. So what, how do you handle those curved balls that are thrown at you? That was the experience that I got. Oh my God, I can't tell you. Now I'm a coach, so I could tell that I could have addressed those emotions yeah. and discussed it separately. But in that moment, I just said, oops, uh, you know, for the ones who want to perhaps take a water break or go wash their face, please feel free to do so. And, you know, let's get right into what we are here for. Uh, but, oh, my God, that was one experience that I always remember. I'm like, I had a plan. It didn't go by that plan. Something else happened. So, you know, you got to be conscious of not everything is how you think it is, but there could be others who've experienced it differently. So. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that is a very shocking thing for your first session. Like I, 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 I do not envy you, but I think it's a really good exercise. But so I, I, I think that's that's a very, I would say, interesting way to open up and and for not just that particular session, but open up your career as a trainer as well. 
tell me how like like and and one thing you mentioned in that is that things very seldom go according to plan in a training room and, and i remember one of my favorite uh, my, one of my mentors used to say um people are very different from numbers numbers are 1 2 3 4 people can be anything from a to b to z to 1 to 5 to 6 and everything and they can be that at the same moment at the same time so they are very much more volatile and they're very much they they they're not people or, or not in a sense predictable as a trainer in a sense how have you learned to manage that and 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 when and did you find yourself being able to go with the flow and being able to you know still meet the objectives of your trainings while at the same time going with the rhythm of the group that you have it's just it's a very hard skill to acquire so how did you acquire it or when did you feel like you were beginning to acquire it yeah well thank you for acknowledging that it's a hard skill harsha because a lot of people out there think it anyone can be a trainer okay as long as they know the subject matter expert now that's the difference harsha in a trainer and a facilitator mm-hmm. right in modern day language we we no longer really train but we facilitate and whilst i have been lucky to have gone through learnings myself to how do i handle these ambiguous situations you know not going it our way etc uh, but i'm not going to bore you with the theory of it but i'm going to share with you you know how how i have handled that and i'll go back to two simple questions um harsha one is are you clear of what you want to cover in that day mm-hmm. right while i'm going to use powerpoints but we no longer use as many powerpoints i am i love more unstructured work and i always start my sessions with hey this is what i'm here to cover it's it's not what you came here to teach but it's what they want to learn and the other thing is how do you marry that so you got to be extremely open and i tell this to people that while you know i'm here to teach about this topic i know about it it's really for them to learn a little bit more and one thing that always works harsha to bring these people um who might be close become a little open in the session is link it to what's in it for them you know this could be a skill that would help them professionally but can this be a life skill how can it help them become a better individual and there is no one that i know who doesn't want to you know become a better version of themselves so very very well said and it's a very enlightened perspective to have as a trainer as you said if many people often think it's about knowing the subject material but i think more and more we're beginning to see it's about knowing the people element of it and of course having amazing grasp of the subject material but i think that's the differentiator and it's very interesting because you started off as a trainer at a very young age and you as you said you were doing this while you were studying as well i i study uh similarly part time i i work full time as well so so i understand that it can be quite a handful managing having your career managing your exams managing in a sense two different lives that run parallel how was it like for you in a sense and how did you were you able to strike a balance did one of it feed into another or were you like many people i know in the midst of the chaos and just managing your flow as well as you could <laughs> you know so thankfully to my school education which was um in, in a nicely run convent school you know our our english language was pretty good i'd say and thanks to all the sisters who and the teachers that i've been blessed to um study with during my childhood so you know i had a choice when i came back from the sailing uh, stint to say hey what do i need to study now right because i would do ideally bsc nautical studies bachelor's of nautical studies in the as a sailor but then here i said okay uh, let me do something that's not as tough because i was working so i chose english literature harsha uh, that seems not tough easy. at all oh okay <laughs> and and you know of course it's not easy but i had some friends who were actually teaching actually my cousin's sister who was a teacher um who would teach literature so i did get some extra lessons from her what i would do is i was working in different parts of the country i was still with uh, genpack and continuing my studies and every year during exams i would come to delhi uh, that's where uh, you know my center was and i was doing it from delhi university and i would buy the books i would actually read them overnight 
and perhaps if the day or the timetable allowed a day before and go write exam you know and i don't know my handwriting was good maybe the teachers who were checking felt that you know this guy knows his stuff and i wrote a lot of stuff uh because i had read that novel and and you know i i would get decent marks to complete my graduation year on year my dad would be hey you've passed again i don't know how you're doing it you know and and of course i would use some of those things that jane austen for example one of the uh, you know great authors that we would read in literature would t- uh, tell us uh, you know use it as stories or anecdotes in in my training so it also helped me sound uh literate if you will right so it helped me both ways but you ask me how did i do it i still don't know god god was kind he knew i was working and doing that so he said help this child so um you know i passed through but i did choose my post graduation i left my work and i did mba in strategic human resource management because by then i had worked in hr for a while so uh you know that's when i spent a lot of time in the library really understanding strategic uh, hr and yeah so um, yeah and, good experience and an mba is slightly different because you're building on experiences that you've had in the working world and you're trying to kind of add the theory to experience to enhance the, the your ability to carry things up what was well and and i can kind of see the inspiration for doing the mba and all of that but was it helpful as someone who who you seem very experiential driven in a sense was having that academic i would say structure of the mba helpful in being able to contextualize the things that you were learning in your your day to day trainings or what do you think was the edge that it gave you moving forward from that oh absolutely harsha you know i had a choice between doing psychology Mm-hmm. or you know choosing to do my uh, mba and the reason i made that call of doing an mba is because i would get more understanding of marketing finance and and you know business as a whole and i generally get this that i spent a lot of money learning few words that i can throw at business leaders but those words are something that i understand you know in those years we would use about paradigm shift strategy leverage synergies you know some of these words that and even today uh competitive advantage first mover advantage porter's five forces and what not right so pest pestel i did all of those analysis on uh, things so help me really widen my uh, training hr experience marry it with real time business situations you know and that till today serves me well harsha and to your point gives me an edge because i uh, i love strategy you know and and uh, a lot of business leaders sort of really operate from that paradigm so it's 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 easier to connect with them at that level uh, so definitely an edge i still keep doing a little bit of psychology courses you know i did positive psychology as uh, hence i found you or you found me um so i keep you know sharpening the saw uh, uh, as steven kavi said but it definitely gave me an edge to understand the broader context of uh, business that you work in um, you know day to day amazing let's go through some of those different experiences you had and how you were able to apply the things that you were learning i think we have some photos we have a photo of you teaching an mba class so we're going to put that on the spin since we were just talking about it but tell me about this photo where are you what's happening here oh yeah so uh, you have the hod uh, here uh, the lady in the yellow sari right in front um and i'm sitting right behind mm-hmm. this is the full class i would go once a year to one of the management institutes in india they are known mm-hmm. for their hr academics and i would teach hr analytics you know course to these uh, mba students how does analytics and data cut through uh you know a vertical or a function like hr and how are we using that to become to make more informed decisions be more data driven and all of that i i love to give back i come from a family of teachers my great grandfather was a teacher my grandfather was a principal in one of the institutes in india so yeah so i'd love to go back and teach uh, it feel makes me feel connected to my roots in some ways 
And yeah, it's always a pleasure to go to academic institutes, meet young thinkers, you know, their questions, uh, how their outlook of life is, and yeah, makes you, you know, somewhere more relevant in today's times. So how does teaching an MBA class like this differ from your regular corporate programming? Because you, you do a lot of trainings, but as you said, every group is different. So does the demographic, the fact that they are MBA students, change the way you deliver or the, change the content or the context that you're delivering in? And if so, what's the difference in a way? Yeah, that's a good question, Harsha. You know, when I'm, when I'm facilitating in an organization, it, the context is that organization, the values, mm -hmm you know, what are their cultural tenants, etc. And aligning what we are doing to that is very important. When you go to an academic institute, uh, there are no limits. You know, these questions can, uh, these guys can ask you a question from anywhere. They are so more connected. They would have read a journal yesterday, which I have had no clue that the research has happened on, right? <laughs> so so uh, I go there in all humility and I say, I'm going to talk about this topic, but you guys are much more learned than I am. Because when was the last time I read a journal, right? When was the last time that I opened an academic book to understand the theory of how analytics is the new thing in HR, you know, back in the day. So uh, the mindset is very different in, in an organizational context. I have some sort of a cushion, uh, but there I, I have no cushion, you know, so I have to be much more prepared. I, I actually read a lot more uh, about just anything, because these guys can link it to multiple things that they are studying. And whilst in organizational context, the topic is, is much more, um, you know, structured and direct in, 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 uh, in that sense. Makes lots of sense. Makes lots of sense. Moving into having an organizational context. I like this photo. I think it, it, it captures, you know, the expression on, on, on the people you're working with face very well. And you can see the hand gestures and all. Well, tell us about that that experience, that training that you were giving. Yeah, you know, there is um, design thinking. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the tenets of design thinking is human-centered, uh, uh, you know, sort of work. And, and, you know, everything that we do has an element of customer centricity now. So in some sense, it's like, as, as a talent professional, if I have to create something, it's no longer top down. You know, it's keeping the learner in my context or the customer in a product organization context at the center of everything that you do. So this specific uh, picture, we were running uh, a session where we were actually creating something by the people who would actually be consuming it. So we were, you know, it was a hackathon but it was driven by the people. So they were creating prototypes and working on real time challenge or an issue. And then we used a shark tank approach. So, you know, they would wow. create a prototype. Yeah, they would create a prototype. We would have organizational leaders who then they will pitch to. And they don't really invest in that idea monetarily, but they invest in it, you know, can, can it go to market in the organization itself? So this was very interesting. I was one of the mentors who designed this, um, you know, hackathon that we were running, uh, targeted specifically at solving uh, people-related issues in, in our organization. Absolutely amazing. And I love that you brought up that point about customer centricity. I love the whole concept, you know, where people who are the users are designing things. My question to you is, Many times I feel like there's this perception that as trainers, as facilitators, we have to know every single thing about the topic. We are the expert in a sense. But one of the things that I feel like from your stories is you put a little spin on this. Like when you mentioned the MBA students, you you expect that, okay, they may have more of an academic background on this. You you work with, with, with groups like this in a sense where you expect, okay, they may know the, the customer or they may know kind of the market better in a sense. And, and definitely there is a role for trainers to facilitate that conversation. But I feel as someone who has been in that shoes in, a, in very few points in time, there can be a sense of, oh my gosh, am I the right person to do this? Or, oh my gosh, there's, there's always this, this imposter syndrome that there is in my young Gen Z brain that, that, that kicks in when we are in those situations where we know we, are, we may not be the subject matter expert, 
and it can be sometimes hard to, to, to remember our what we bring to the table when you're surrounded by all of these intelligent questions or people who know the industry better. How do you, if you have any, you may, you may not even face this problem, but if you do have any imposter syndrome or any sense of, 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 of not of, or, or, or unsure where you stand, how do you bring together the conference to still do your best? Because at the end of the day, as a facilitator, you are still the glue that holds the whole session together. So you've got to be rock solid, like solid in, in your mindset. And so how do you keep that up in situations like that? Yeah, you know, it's a combination, Harsha. And it's such a good question again, Harsha. You can't know everything about everything, right? Uh, but what does help is how aware have you been during your life? Yeah, what I mean is in that moment, a question may come up where you don't have a clue about it, right? But you may not have prepared for it, but hey, you read something, you saw something, you know, that can contribute to the topic. You can bring that in. But if you haven't been reading, if you haven't been um, reading, you know, world affairs, current affairs, or just any other book. So I think reading... Harsha is the key. And, and I know our attention spans are reducing, you know, we no longer, we're more on audiobooks, podcasts, you know, um, reels, right? So yeah. uh, it is, it is so interesting, Harsha, you should see the tennis matches. Uh, I love sports, uh, you know, tennis matches when they are played and when the replays are shown on the website, they are under three minutes. That wasn't the case earlier. So, you know, everyone has realized that our attention spans are reducing and people might not have 12 minutes to look through something, right? So, so I think whatever format speaks to you, read. And whenever, if you are reading, you are talking to someone, just absorb and truly be present because you never know, you might be talking about a hedge fund somewhere with someone and then you come back and you're talking to a business leader and that conversation there, if you were really present, could actually help you make a point to this business leader. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so you're always curious, inherent curiosity uh, that can get satiated through continuous reading can help you look, you can be an avid reader, but still you can be in a situation, oh my God, I don't know how to answer this, which is fine, accept it. Uh, but, you know, there could be one topic where you're unable to contribute, but there are a lot of other topics that you might have some sense of because of your reading that you might have done in the past. So, yeah, just be curious. Every experience in life, every interaction in life teaches you something. Can you grasp it? Uh, and perhaps, you know, sometime in life, it can also come in handy. Yeah, it's very interesting. This adds almost another layer to what you said earlier, you know, knowing what you are in control of in a sense in your life and i think like when we recognize that we see that all of these little experiences are there for a reason in a sense and you are in control of that and it's kind of like our job as the individual going through that to be present to to, to absorb to understand because it will help in the future and, and you have that in essentially your arsenal of tools as you go through life and, and it, so oh, very very interesting flip on the question very nicely answered uh, and as we start to wind down this conversation and all of that, you now move into a role that, that is looking more at talent, that is looking more at, at people who are coming in the organization, people that are in the organization itself in a way. In your experiences in a sense, and, and, and you've seen this in training rooms, you've seen this in organizational HR, what do you think is something that enables people to work together effectively for an amazing, like, like for a shared goal within an organization? Because so, uh, I, I remember going for a training once and the trainer said this, we, we all know what is the right thing to do. We all know how to be a good leader. We all know in theory how to be a good team player and all of that. But then put into a context of an actual team, an actual organization, all of the pressures, the deadlines and all of that. And that, that becomes a completely different story. So in your experience of meeting all of these different people uh, working in these organizations, what are the qualities that a person needs to actually be able to play a part in achieving the goals of an organization. Yeah, I think the word that's coming to me, Harsha, is relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, invest 
and truly nurture relationships in an organization, outside an organization. You know, they always help you. You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you, Harsha, look, Harsha and uh, a colleague has a great rapport, have great relationship, it could be based on trust, common understanding, all of those great tenets, right? But that heart of it, how's your relationship? Pretty good. I have a good rapport with that individual. And that individual is supposed to do something for you or you're going to do something together. And that individual is not pulling his or her weight. What are the chances that you will uh, take it on you and complete that task? The chances are high. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? You know the person. Yeah. You're friends. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now flip it. You're not friends. You use the term. Right. And that guy or that individual is not pulling his or her weight. What will you do, Harsha? Oh, you're a lot more reserved. You're a lot more, you know, easier to point fingers to. Yeah. Right. So I think at the heart of it is just having those relationships or, well, what you termed it as friend, you know, Gallup also calls it in one of his questions, do you have a friend at work? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, one of the 12 cues of Gallup. So th there you are. You know, I, I have seen great relationships can can really get the work done. And, and so hence the investment in nurturing relationships in, in an organization or even outside that organization. And, you know, just having real conversations. A lot of times my team members would come and talk about an individual. And I said, you're saying the right thing, but to the wrong person. <laughs> you know, so okay. get hold of that individual. If you don't want to sit in an office environment, take him or her for a walk downstairs, uh, meet him or her over coffee, you know, because the environment also plays a big role and then have that conversation. And more often than not, I get a call back later in the day saying thank you for uh, encouraging me to have that one-on-one -on -one on honest conversation. We, you know, sort of settled a lot of uh, things and put them to rest. It's worked. Very interesting. You know, final question, and, and I'm so sad we've actually come to the end of all 45 minutes. You oh. have been so insightful to talk to, and, and, and I think there's so much that I can learn and our audience can learn from hearing your many different experiences. So I'll try to summarize with this final question. I'll try my best. For, for you, in a sense, you seem to have so many different components of your life that fit together very seamlessly. Your family, your, your career, your own personal learning and development. You seem to, to be able to, to kind of have found the rhythm to balancing all of that. Is it important to, to is it important to you as an individual to have equal priority in all of that? And if so, how can many of us, you know, in the midst of shaping how our careers look like, make sure that we keep in mind all of these different elements in life and we, we, we're giving them equal attention and, and, and love and, 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 and as we progress and grow in our careers? Oh, Harsha, that's such a good question, especially as, as you are coming through your career to, to be to be so much more um, in control. And I say this, and I've read it somewhere, have a plan for yourself. If not, someone else will. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, so so as a, as a young individual who's, you know, sort of getting into uh, academics or professional career, what is it that matters to you? You know, the why. Simon Sinek talks about it, right? The why is so important. And as, and you know, you keep discovering it, you keep creating it in some sense. So just be at it and you will get there. Now, you know, with, I'm talking to you, Harsha, I've come this far because of some things that perhaps I may have done, I don't know, but some things that definitely the universe has enabled for me. You know, I believe in that a lot, Harsha. And, and just having that faith, again, I would say that, and just being curious about others, building that relationship, and then knowing why you are doing what you're doing and what gives you that joy, what gives you that happiness. So I will not finish work if I don't have anything compelling to do after, <laughs> right? I finish work because I know I have to go jump into a squash court. I have to jump into a yoga studio. I have to go drive, meet a friend. 
you know, I have to go have coffee with someone that I met, uh, you know, at a function. I have to go help a friend uh, buy something for herself or himself, right? I have to take my wife out. We haven't gone out for a while. So having those plans for yourself and a compelling reason to, to get off work, because if you don't, then you know work never ends. You know, it can go on and on and on. So uh, I think having a compelling reason, they say, what do you do after uh, you finish work? Or what do you do when you finish those eight, nine, 10, whatever hours that you put to something? You could be researching, you could be studying, you could be working. What is your life before and after? And so that's very, very important. I think that's what's helped me to somewhere strike a balance. I still am a long, long way off, but I think uh, I continue to strive. Yeah, so very, I would say, enlightening answer. It's something that I struggle personally with a lot. I, I'm very focused on my work, that, that often, you know, everything else kind of fades into the peripheral view. So, okay, I, I like that point. And, and I'm going to try to apply it. That's my mission for the week. Okay, set concrete plans for everything else. Okay, okay, doable. I'll, I'll, I'll work on this. All right. But like all your answers today, I think you have been an absolute joy to talk to. And, and I think that the audience is going to agree with me that you have just given us so much insight, not just in your career, but also in as an individual, what can we be doing differently? How can we be thinking about the world around us differently? And I'm just so grateful to have this conversation. So thank you so much for being on the show. And I really do hope we can have you back sometime in the future and get more of your thoughts, get more of your experiences. So appreciate it. And, and hopefully you had a fraction of the amount of fun that I did talking to you, sharing your experiences with us. Oh, oh, absolutely, Harsha. And this is one of the things that gives me joy and happiness. So, you know, spend time doing things that gives you happiness. I did it with you. So thank you for having me here. Um, you know, it, these these last 45 minutes or an hour have been really, really insightful. Because when I share, I get to learn so much. And your questions have been uh, really reflective and, uh, you know, deep questions. So thank you for that. Find your happiness and spend time doing what gives you happiness and joy more and more. Thank you. Very nicely summarized. And with that, our interview is drawn to a close. Thank you so much for joining us as a speaker. And to our audience, as always, thank you so much for joining us as today's uh, viewers as well. If you have any questions, if there's anything you want to talk about, make sure you reach out and drop it in the show chat below. Or you can always email it over as well. And with that, this is Harsha signing off. Until next Thursday. You're listening to Changing Reality. Changing Reality, where we bend reality all across the world. Only on WQHS Radio.